guys, I am painfully aware that I am the last person standing between you and the Sunset Cantina. So we're going to go ahead and get started so we get this over with in a timely manner. Um, my name is Ashley Clojay. I'm a lead designer at Boston University's Interactive Design Department. And I'm super excited to talk to you today about documentation. Woo! And I realize how ridiculous that sounds, um, especially coming from a designer, right? Why am I not talking about design or usability or maybe even building things? Documentation, really? It seems like an odd choice, right? Well, as it turns out, I'm actually going to be talking about all three of these things today because all of those things are documentation. You just can't talk about documentation without talking about design and usability and how things are built. And to illustrate that point, we're actually going to have a quick chat about Boston driving. <laughs> now, who here has had the pleasure of driving in Boston today? Raise your hands. Exactly three people. Awesome. Well, you three people will get this. The rest of you who didn't raise their hands but you actually did drive in Boston will get it. And for those who haven't driven in Boston, it's a rough experience. Uh, you've got lots of one-way roads. You've got lots of sort of circular, um, looped types of roads. Nothing's aligned north and south. There's no grids. It's, it's tough. And people expect you to know where you're going. So as far as the UX of driving in Boston goes, it, it's not a good time. But anyway, Boston driving's on the mind because I just bought a new house. And that means I have to relearn my whole commute from my new house to Boston University. And the first thing that I do when I learn my new commute is I pull up Google Maps. Give it up for Google Maps. Directions from point A to point B. Um, Google Maps is awesome, but being that this is a new place for me, new directions for me, some of these things don't exactly make sense to me. Like, I don't have a good understanding of what, you know, turn right onto Perry Street and then go 350 feet means, because I'm not familiar with the area. That's where the maps part of Google Maps comes in. You get a nice visual of what those directions mean and what that route is. And that's awesome, because now I have a general sense of where I'm going and some visuals to help me out. Now, when we talk about documentation, this is where most people stop. You've got a list of directions, a list of how to accomplish something, in this case, getting to Boston University, and some visuals to help you understand how to get there and navigate you through that. So if that's sufficient, I should be able to get to Boston University just on those things, right? Shouldn't be a problem. Let's see how we do. So the first few directions are going to be fine. It's getting pretty straightforward, right? Some lefts and go straights and whatnot. And the sharp eye among you may notice that this is not actually on the route, but it's an intersection I'd love to pick on. This is a real intersection in Boston. It is a five-point intersection, which means five roads are all coming to the same place at the same time. And what Google Maps is going to tell me here is if I am on Dorchester Avenue, turn left onto Dorchester Street. Now right there. <laughs> right there we have a labeling problem, right? Dorchester Avenue to Dorchester Street. I don't know, it's kind of funky. Like maybe it's one of those like straight lefts. Not to mention the other two lefts I could be taking. So which of the three lefts am I supposed to be taking at this intersection? You also might notice that there's no signage here. There's no signs telling you where anything is or which street is which. So that's pretty great too. This is exactly as it looks um, as you approach the intersection. As it turns out, the answer is the closest one. That's an interesting thing, right? The closest left. That's not a direction Google can give you. It's the sort of direction a human would give you. This is where we have real value in documentation. When we empathize with our users and we put ourselves in the driver's seat, we have an opportunity to say, OK, I have this awful, confusing thing in front of me. How do I make it make sense to the person using it? That is what documentation should be. And that is where people um, just aren't getting to with the plain list of directions and the map. Because when your UI is easy to understand and you know pretty uh, easy to navigate, makes sense, you know, like New York and a grid, you've got your streets that you can tell whether or not you're going north or south based on the name. Awesome, perfect. Maybe you don't have to get so deep into it. But when you have UI like Boston, <laughs> it's a little rougher. You're going to have to do a little bit more of that empathizing to get people through your UI and through your product. So 
it's super easy to write a list of directions. That's what Google Maps gives us is a list of directions. It's very difficult to come up with that um, good documentation, that really empathetic, what would it make sense to me, um, what direction would make sense to me as I'm driving um, to get through this thing. And if we can say that in that intersection example, that things that contributed to what happened there were how clearly we could read the signs, how the intersection was built in the first place, and whether or not something is honking behind me, being all like, come on, get out of the intersection, you know, make a decision. We can also say that designers and developers and UI UXers, no matter who you are, you are responsible for documentation. And I think that's something we forget. So how can we do it better? Well, to begin with, I think we need to talk about what documentation is. Because most people think of documentation as just a straight wiki, or that list of directions, or the UI and screenshots. But ultimately, the goal of documentation is to teach someone how to do something. Whether it's how to complete a form, or how to build a page in WordPress, um, how to extend a plugin that you've written, if you haven't accomplished the goal of teaching someone how to do that thing, your documentation hasn't done the job. And when you define documentation like this, you start to see that there are other ways of documenting, um, whether it's labeling in the UI or um, the way you set things up that help contribute to that experience. And again, the best documentation empathizes with your users. So you think from the user's perspective, you think about where they're going, what they're doing, and what they need, you will write good documentation. So I'm going to talk about a few things that you can do right away to improve your documentation. Um, from all perspectives, from the UI perspective, um, in your code, just about everywhere. And we have talk about two different audiences today that I tend to work with. I work with documenting both for um, end users, so people who use our UI and a custom theme, um, sometimes uh, meta boxes and things like that, people who are working on the WordPress site, um, our clients basically. The other half of it is I work on our custom in-house framework, which means I am also documenting things for developers. And that's a really important audience to remember too. Now you can apply the sorts of thinking that I'm going to talk about today to any audience. But those are the two examples that we'll go through today. So the first thing you can do, just put your documentation where your users are going to go. Or what literally feels like everywhere. For developers, it's super simple, right? <laughs> just comment your code. There's, it's, this is the absolute easiest way that you can start getting documentation in your workflow. All you, it's really great because if you think about how developers extend your work, how they're going to try to build on and improve things. They're going to rip things apart and try and put them together. And they're going to go first thing to the source to see what you did and how they can break it, basically. <laughs> but as, you do, as they do that, what you can do is leave a comment explaining your intention um, or explaining how you might override something. And, you know, code is a literal list of directions, so you're not trying to repeat the directions here. Um, what you want to do is, again, explain your intention. So in here, I have a small snippet from our framework where I have a particularly confusing width thing here. And I talk about, uh, first of all, there's a little empathizing here. It's like, okay, okay, I get it. This, this is a rough line of code. You're probably really reconsider reconsidering overriding this. But here's how you do it. And I do things like I explain um, how variables are used in there, um, why I made certain decisions with the math, so that people are not only educated on what this code is doing, but also how they might modify it. They might realize that one of these variables in here is actually what they need, and not um, the need to override it. <clears throat> For end users, this might look like putting documentation within the UI, where users are making big decisions. So you've probably heard about the customizer API a couple times today. If you haven't, it's really, really great for um, have, giving users the power to make some design decisions and to customize their own theme. But what isn't great is when they have that ability to 
customized, but they don't have any guidance on why you might want to choose particular um, items in the customizer. So in this case, I have a custom theme that's going to be applied without my guidance later on. And I know that the users, the site admins of the theme, are going to have to make a decision between a top layout or a side layout for their navigation. So when they make that decision, I want them to know why they should make a particular decision. In this case, that they should make the decision, if they have lots and lots and lots of top nav items, to not use that top navigation layout so it doesn't break. If I didn't have that in there, they might start playing around or they might not make a, the best decision for the design in that moment. There's other opportunities to put in the UI as well. Um, at Boston University, we rely heavily on a framework for building meta boxes, CMV2, which is really amazing. But even if you build your own meta boxes, you can do the absolute same thing. The big takeaway here is to put information about those decisions users are making right next to the place that they're going to make those decisions. So you can see right here with this featured image, there's a choose or upload image button. And there's actually some recommended dimensions there. This um, is a good way to get ahead of making sure that your sites don't get too slow with giant images, right? Because they can't just upload anything. I mean, they can, but here we're telling them, hey, could you please make it 500 by 500 pixels before you do that? Giving the users this information right there ensures that they will never forget it when they're uploading that image, and they won't have an opportunity to go off and sort of do their own thing and break the design, basically. So consider putting labeling right next to your UI elements for those users to make it easier on them, and so they don't forget. And, speaking of not forgetting, you can always just put your documentation right in the admin bar, right? This is actually pretty easy to do. There is an admin bar menu hook that um, one of our developers kindly put together um, and put in the theme for me. But what it does is it puts a link to the documentation, and this can be any documentation you want. Um, ours happens to be in WordPress, right in the admin bar. So you can't just lose a PDF in your email somewhere. Or if the um, administrative privileges of the site, the editing of the site, gets handed off to someone else or someone quits, you can't lose that and you can't um, forget it. It will always be there for clients. So this is really great because it ensures that as time goes on, the site will be maintained in the way that you want it. So, next thing you can help, you can do to help your documentation is provide a reference. And this is what people typically think of when it comes to documentation. You want a reference of everything available to you within your product, whether it's your custom theme, a plugin, um, you know, whatever you're building for your clients. You want to provide a reference for them that explains all of the what's in there, what it does, and um, provides some examples of how it's used. Just to make things really clear and show them what tools you're giving them. Because how else are you going to know that, that those tools are available to you if there's not some place to look them up? WordPress.org does a nice job with this, with the code reference. Um, you want to make things easy to find, right? So, if you think about the world's best documentation, things like dictionaries or encyclopedias, all these things that have existed long before the web, they've always been grouped very logically, it's been very easy to scan, and they've explained things in multiple ways, so that you can't misinterpret what's going on, no matter whether you're a layman or you are very familiar with um, the terms that they're talking about. And again, WordPress.org does a great job with this. You'll see they have a nice search function here. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, it's there. You can go right to the search function and get that. But let's say that you know you want to do something with menus, but you're not exactly sure what it's called. But you do know that maybe you want a hook there. You can filter by hooks, and that's an easy way to get to that information. So as you build your documentation, consider these things and consider how people are finding the information in the documentation to work with. From an end user standpoint, that might look like this. This is a plugin called Shortcake. Um, it's really great for providing a UI for shortcodes, and there's a lot of great benefits to using it. 
But what I want to talk about in terms of documentation is that it actually provides a whole list of all the available short codes within the theme right here. So it's sort of like that big reference, right? If you're using Shortcake, you've got the reference there. But it's also searchable. So you know that you want, say, the collapsible short code. You can search for it. It will show right up. It's easy to find. Doing this just makes it a lot easier for end users to see what's available to them, um, in this case in a very visual way, which is kind of nice. And to be able to use it throughout the site so they're not leaning so heavily on you to do all of the content work. And I know this sounds like um, sort of <laughs> a, big, a big situation to build, but you don't have to build it yourself. Consider using tools like SASDoc, PHPDoc, JSDoc, which actually build this for you. This is an example for our responsive um, frameworks documentation. Um, we have separate documentation for the SAS side of things, and that's what I work a lot in. And you'll see that there's this searchable function in here is actually pre-built for us. Things we are grouped really, really nicely over here, and we are able to control that grouping, and it can be outside of how the code is organized. So all of our variables are in a um, particular file because we need to have a file that designers can override variables on. But it doesn't have to be that way in the documentation, and it doesn't make sense to be that way in the documentation, because variables affect um, specific things, right? So we want to talk about what affects a container, what affects the grid. Having that organized in that way in the documentation helps make it easier to build on that hard work that we've done and make sure that people don't just go overriding things in the SAS that could be easier um, to handle with that variable. Again, SAS doc will do a lot of this for you if you format um, your code comments properly. So comment your code, please. You should show them how you use it. This is a big one that I think a lot of us developers forget. Um, we're building things and ripping them apart and trying to figure out how they work. We don't want to spend an hour trying to figure out how to make them work initially, right? So provide a code example for people to build on so that they can spend the time you know, building on your work instead of recreating it. Stripe does an excellent job of this. You can see they have the example request here. And if you want to go one step further, you can actually provide the example response. Um, that's really great so that you know what to expect when um, getting a request from Stripe. And it just helps a lot because then you can build on and modify things. You'll also notice that Stripe does a really great job of grouping. They group things by how you're likely to use their product. So you're likely to talk about returns or products or SKUs. That's how you'll be using the API, so that's how they group things in the documentation. For users, you might want to consider showing that example output in WordPress. So I've shown um, a short code here, and the reason why I'm showing the short code is because WordPress naturally processes those short codes, right? It's going to create the preview for you. So you don't need to spend time creating screenshots when you have a short code and you have the ability to show that example right here, right? Why would you do that? So here's a good example of how you can sort of use the power of WordPress, what it's already doing, just to provide that documentation and do it in a very quick way. Um, it's also nice because if you have a framework, as we do, and say you have the content of that framework and it might be styled from a little differently from the framework to a custom theme, you have all the content in a site, right? You have the short code in a site. The minute you copy that content over and apply the new theme to it, bam, you have updated screen, screenshots. Um, what's really an updated code example right here without even having to do anything. It's a kind of nice setup. Final thing that you can do to improve your documentation, set up consistent naming and design conventions. And I think the talk before me, test, uh, the test talk, touched on this a bit. Um, naming your functions and variables really clearly in a way that explains what they do is a huge boon to this. Um, from the documentation standpoint, we'll also talk about um, how to write content and stuff that follows these guidelines. So before you do anything, consider setting up a consistent system. Uh, my favorite example of this is actually the Four Dummies books. If you've ever read a Four Dummies book, the very first thing they do in the introduction is they just 
just talk about the conventions and the icons and sort of the design cues that you get in the book to help you understand what information you're getting and why and what stuff you can skip. So do that, and that way you will be spending your time formatting things consistently and not going back constantly to say, oh, well, maybe this should look this way or this should look that way. And then your users will also understand very quickly what the conventions are. It'll be easier to see what code is, what an example response is, things like that. Make it easy to scan. From a design standpoint um, and from an information standpoint, documentation is, tends to be really heavy. So it's really critical to think about things like typography and white space. This is a chance to exercise your design skills if you're not a designer like me but you like to, to dip your toes in that sort of thing. Um, the Stripe API does an excellent job of this. You can see it's very easy to scan um, everything from introduction to topics to core resources. And especially here, I love how the attributes are just like very clearly defined from the general um, explanation of what's going on with errors. And you can quickly scan you know, different types, the messages, the code. It's all very easy to see, and it's a really pleasant experience to move through. So Stripe, again, does an excellent job with this. Um, take design cues from that and just make the focus your documentation. Keep it short, sweet, and simple. This is another one that um, I wish developers would do more often. I don't always have the technical terms to understand exactly what you're talking about in your documentation. And neither do people like product project managers or account managers, other people who might be looking at your documentation to see something is possible, um, and you know, just make sure that something isn't a bad idea before they promise it to someone else. So as you write your documentation, you should strive to try and keep away from the technical jargon, try and explain it you know, from that initial perspective where, you know, yeah, you have to have a little bit of knowledge of something, but Try to explain more what is happening and less about um, the very technical terms that can sometimes come up in documentation. I know you can't always avoid that, but do the best you can. The dictionary is a good example. You can see that um, any dictionary will actually try and explain a word in several different ways, right? They'll say it's this, but it's also this and also that. Um, and here they'll say, okay, well, here are actually a couple other things that are sort of like that. So maybe you understand one of these things, you'll understand this word. They also actually give an example. The dictionary is actually a really cool example of documentation. Um, and it's been around forever. So, you know, be like the dictionary. It's pretty cool. And I realize that you can get to the end of the project and say, oh, man, I just, I don't have time for documentation. I can't do this. This is so long. It's, I, I just, I, I don't have time, I gotta launch. So, try not to get to that point. Our last talk talked about um, testing and te um, test-driven development. Well, if you're already writing the test and you're already writing how something's supposed to function, maybe it's not a bad time to write about documentation, right? Maybe you can do your documentation then. Or maybe, maybe you just have so much and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know how I can get a handle on this. There's so much to document. Well, we document first. Well, you could start analyzing your help desk tickets, right? This was a great tip I got last week at WP Campus from, um, from a guy over at Modern Tribe. He said that what they did is they analyzed their help desk tickets to see the most common problems, the things that were really hurting users and that were really hurting them by having to reply to over and over and over again. So they analyzed those and they were able to quickly start documenting things in a way that helped them out right away. So that can be a cool one. My personal favorite is just carve out time every Friday. <laughs> Pick a day you like where you know you're not going to be able to work on something else, where you know you're just going to be brain dead and you're not going to be able to get anything worthwhile done, and do documentation then. Um, some of it is very thoughtful work. You have to think from your user's perspective, but it's a different type of thoughtful work than you might be doing in other applications. So it can kind of be a nice break. Now, if that's too boring for you, if you're just sitting like, okay, no, documentation's boring. I can't, I can't sit down and write all this stuff. 
Do something different. There's some cool examples out there. You can literally make a game of it. Apple actually just announced this, um, this game that will be coming out this fall for iOS. And what it is, is it's Swift Playgrounds. It teaches, it's, the goal is to teach young children to code using Swift. Which is cool, right? That's, a, that's sort of a form of documentation. You're getting kids into Swift. You're getting them learning about programming. Um, it's a neat way to do it. They actually have a couple of cool design features here. I love this for loop design here. Like, it feels very loopy, right? It's got the orange to the, to the border to the orange. I don't know. I think it's super cool. But what you're seeing on this slide is they have kids write a for loop to move a character around the scene to the right. So you actually get really um, nice, immediate feedback about what you're doing, and you get kind of a fun prize for it, right? You make it through the level. So I think that's a really cool sort of alternate way to do documentation or to get people into um, a particular language. You can start your own style guide. Uh, some people really like doing this sort of thing. I've been putting it off myself, so I can't say I'm one of them. But, you know, maybe you just want to start um, keeping rogue styles in check and keeping things more consistent across your UI. A style guide is a form of documentation. It documents how your design is to be built and output. So, if you're, if you're tired of documenting the functionality of something, maybe try this. You know, do a little documentation here. You could do something fun with Slack. We're Slack users at Boston University, and I'm really interested in looking more into how to leverage Slackbot and um, the Slack API to communicate with GitHub. Because I know Slack has an API and GitHub has an API. So I'm sure there's something there. Maybe they could talk to each other and maybe, maybe Slackbot could answer some questions for me. Um, the most uh, common question that I get uh, on Slack is, do we have documentation for this or do we have documentation for that? Which is, that's great. I'm really glad people are reaching out to me. But it'd be sort of cool if somebody could help me out with those requests. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe there's something to do there. Maybe you could automate some of the documentation. Or make your own playground. I love playgrounds. Uh, I think there is probably a pretty good reason why most uh, people who learned HTML and CSS started on W3 schools and whether or not that's the best source of information ever. I think it's because of that playground, right? The try it editor. It gives you such immediate feedback. You can see if there's an error. You can see what's going on. Um, in this case, I'm using Sassmeister. Sassmeister is my favorite. Um, you've got some actions about my bunnies there. Please ask me about them later. I love them. <laughs> but having immediate feedback and understanding what causes an error is huge to learning. So if you want to teach your client something or you want to teach a fellow um, colleague something, Maybe this is a fun way to do it. Like maybe you have lots of extra time and you say, okay, well, I'll teach them how things work and give them really immediate feedback and maybe it'll be through a playground. Um, other examples of this type of learning might be uh, pair coding, right? You know, you get really immediate feedback from somebody hanging over your shoulder and saying, no, you did that wrong. <laughs> or maybe try it this other way. Excuse me for a moment here. So there are a lot of reasons to love documentation. They are all excellent. Please take this slide home and show it to your boss. <laughs> it makes your users more self-sufficient. Um, if you have good documentation and people go and seek out that documentation because it's a lot faster than going to your help desk, maybe you'll get fewer help desk tickets, right? Um, make your users more self-sufficient and they won't ask you so many questions. Debugging takes a lot less time. You're not going to get somebody uh, shaming you or coming over to your desk being like, I don't understand how your code works, please explain it to me. Um, if you're on the Marcom side, like I am, marketing and communications, it protects your brand. That's actually pretty key, right? You want your web experience to be really great, really smooth, and um, to really reflect who you are as a brand. And without good documentation and the why behind what you're doing, websites will fail on this and they will kind of go off and do their own thing. So document things like your brand and you know why not to link outside to outside sites in your main navigation. Protects your hard work. Um, as developers, if you've built something that can be extended and you want people to extend it in a certain way, but you don't have it documented, 
people will try to find their own way to extend it. And then you might get really lucky. It might be the same way you intended, and it might all work out, and rainbows and ponies. Or it might be really, really horrible, and you might have to go back and say, okay, look, no, really, you should be doing it this way. This is what I intended you to do, and you know, this is much simpler. Look, you could have saved so much time. And my personal favorite, it's a really cool problem with lots and lots of solutions. But those aren't actually the reasons why I love documentation. To get to why I love documentation, I really have to look at why it is I do what I do. And I originally wrote this talk for um, WP Campus, for an education crowd. So what I said was that you know everybody stays in education for a reason. You know, no matter how you come by education. So I came, came into education by accident. I didn't mean to work at Boston University. I just kind of ended up there. And it, here I am, three years later, I'm still there. And there's a reason for that. The reason for me is that I truly believe in the power of education. I believe in the power of learning and of teaching others about the things we know. And I love that mission. I just love furthering that. And documentation, even though I am not a teacher by name, not a faculty member, even though I am a designer, documentation gives me an opportunity to do that. And that's powerful. I don't know if I have other opportunities to do that sort of thing. And even if you're not in documentation, or in education, excuse me, you have opportunities to do this as well. And if there's nothing else you take from this talk today, if you think of nothing else after this, I hope you think of the fact that you too have these opportunities. Whether it's speaking at a conference, contributing to WordPress, or, as I prefer, documentation, you have the ability to share your experiences and your unique insights with people. And people do want to learn. I've been very lucky and very fortunate to work with very good developers over the years who have been patient with me and have explained to me things in several different ways until I've finally gotten it. And I've learned so much from that. So please consider sharing that with the world. Consider, just consider sharing that. I hope you will. Thank you.
high school, I love when people provide multiple examples. It's, it's so awesome to see how people can bend and bring things. Um, I saw a hand. Yes. Okay. Uh, first, great job on the presentation and on the documentation. It looks cool. Uh, how do you convince your superior to do the documentation and spend the time on it? Because that looks like a lot of time. And did you see any benefits? Like, did you see like decrease in workload on work report and other desk? I have to admit, I've been sneaky. I've been doing it anyway. <laughs> Um, I really love documentation and I've been finding time to do it. But as I've been finding time, I've also been able to say, look at these results and look how much easier it is for you to build on stuff. Um, I'm lucky that my superiors actually have to build on the same thing that I'm documenting. So they've got all, they've got complaints about, oh, it's really hard to find this, or I'm not sure how to use this. And I can be like, well, look at this over here, look what I built, look. <laughs> um, so that's been a good way to sort of get them interested in it. Uh, I've been really, I'm really lucky that Boston University is very supportive of documentation um, and the ISMP people and the training people have done amazing work on the WordPress documentation as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Any particular uh, pet peeves or advice that you would give to developers coming from more of a design perspective? Please, 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 please explain things <laughs> from my perspective. Sometimes, sometimes you use a word and I don't know what that word is, but I'll get the concept, right? I'll be able to explain that, you know, this does this and this and this and this and this, but I won't be able to say what it is. And I know that's a com communication problem on my part. I know I need to learn these terms, but it's really tough getting over that hurdle. So that, that's probably takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is please be nice. We do want to learn. Um, I have encountered developers before that are not so friendly to learning. And if you don't get things explained as they see it, if you're still not understanding, they're a little hostile about it. So know that it's not a sign that I don't want to learn. It's just maybe a sign that I'm not understanding the language you're speaking and I need things explained in a slightly different way. Anybody else? Awesome. We'll have a lovely rest of the evening.